Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode... This week on Plenary Session, I'm joined by Alex John London. Alex John London is a professor of philosophy at Carnegie Mellon University, and he's going to talk about the role of philosophy, COVID-19, and some interesting discussion about COVID exceptionalism. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, vinayprasadmdmph. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. I'm back in plenary session, joined via Zoom by Professor Alex John London. Alex is a professor of philosophy at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, He is somebody who does a fair bit of work at the intersection of philosophy, medicine, clinical trials, um, the practice of medicine. Um, And he's somebody who I have admired for a long time now, and we've long had overlapping interests, I think, in the space of cancer drugs and clinical trials and portfolios, a collaborator of, I think, a guest of this podcast, Jonathan Kimmelman. Um, and um, Professor London is somebody who's written a lot of very interesting things about, I think, the trials and 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 how we think about trials when it comes to COVID-19, particularly the clinical side of it. Um, Alex John London, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for having me. I guess I should say a longtime listener, first time caller. Shut up. You listen to plenary <laughs> session. I'm so sorry. So um, I wonder if you might, you might start with this. I'll, I'll, I'll toss something out to you. Um, we have a new pathogen, SARS-CoV-2. Apparently it made a jump from some pangolin, or perhaps a bat, into a human being potentially early December of 2019. Some are saying it made a jump from a research laboratory, but I, I don't want to get into all that. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not, that's above my pay grade. But it made a jump. It jumped into people. Then it wreaked havoc in Wuhan, wreaked havoc in Lombardy, and, um, and then finally we in the U.S., we took it seriously finally after, after downplaying it for months on television. Then we finally took it seriously. Um, and then it came and hit our shores, and it hit New York City. And in those early days of the pandemic, um, I think doctors were undeniably in a tough situation. Um, it was, uh, from my understanding of people who worked in New York in the time, it was just COVID, COVID, COVID. Every person coming in was brought in with COVID. And some of the early reports were deeply concerning that this was affecting young people, killing even young people. Um, naturally, doctors wanted to do everything possible to help SARS-CoV-2 patients recover from this illness. And naturally, we didn't know a lot about the illness. We didn't know what drugs in our armamentarium might help. Um, yet the temptation to reach on the back shelf and grab something that, you know, had some signal of promise. Maybe there's an old study that shows it helps a coronavirus, a different coronaviridae in a different lab experiment. Who knows? We're going to reach back there and find some hydroxychloroquine and boom, we throw it in the patient. Or we reach back there and we, we heard a rumor that these patients have a lot of blood clots. So we take that blood clot medicine and we crank up the blood clot medicine. And so we did a lot of this early in the pandemic. Um, and, and, and you were somebody who, and I want you to kind of tell us a little bit about your background, how you come to this, and we can come to that eventually, but you were somebody who watched this and thought about this, and I wonder if you might walk us through how you think about such situations, Um, something new, undeniably bad, scary, um, doctors want to do what's best. How how should they go from there? How do you think about this? Well, um, you know, as as someone who's been involved in... um, ethics of clinical medicine, but also public health ethics for a long time, um, the emergence of this novel disease comes in the context of Ebola and prior outbreaks where we've been in a similar situation and, uh, and where we have um, made mistakes and then written papers about lessons learned. And you can look back at lessons learned papers and many of them are very similar. (laughs) Okay, so the lesson should be sticking. Yeah, okay, okay. That's right. (laughs) That like, you know, we've made the same mistakes and and there were lessons that we didn't learn. And for a long time, 
you know, one of the issues was how can we quickly get the trials off the ground that we need to in order to be able to figure out what's actually going to, you know, advance the interests of the patients that we have before us. Um, and that was a huge problem in the 2014, 2015 Ebola outbreak, um, you know, in West Africa. It took us a long time to get those trials in the field. And most of the therapeutics trials didn't recruit enough patients in order. They were mounted so late. They didn't recruit enough patients to give us, you know, much information. But the vaccine trial we, we had, we had better luck with. And so, you know, the, the worry I had uh, early on in, um, in this pandemic uh, was, are we going to be able to stand up the studies that we need in order to figure out, right, generate the evidence base uh, 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 that we need in order to know what to do? And the interesting thing was, it seemed like half of the lessons from uh, Ebola sort of took, mm. in, in the sense that we mounted a lot of research, thousands of studies uh, proposed, uh, but the problem was, this sort of exceptional attitude that um, the exigency of this circumstance means it's okay to cut the corners on the aspects of science that are necessary to give us the reliable information we need to actually intervene in the causal nexus to help patients. And so a lot of effort was spent on small studies that we know from the very beginning are unlikely to produce that much value. That's very well put. So I guess I wonder if you might just say, uh, just flat out, I mean, w why do we need the trial to practice medicine? I guess you're telling somebody who feels very similarly to how you do. But I mean, what, would, what if there's somebody listening and they're like, you know, well, why do you even need these trials? Just give all this shit out to the pay. I mean, give all these medicines. They're all good. They can't do anything. You know, they've got to be good. you got to try. This is war. This is battlefield medicine. You just got to try. And then later you'll know what works. Figure it out later. But why? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that not good? Yeah. I, I mean, look, it, 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 um, so I think we, we have a culture of medicine um, and uh, it, it, that that takes a particular circumstance as its paradigm. Uh, and that's a circumstance in which we're operating in the think if you want to think of it in like a geographical term, we're operating inside the the. Um, uh, you know, in, in the inland of, of the terrain that we've mapped out. So where we know, where we're familiar, we know what to do. Uh, then when people come into the emergency department, right, act quickly, act expeditiously and deploy the knowledge that we have in order to advance the interests of those patients. That's kind of the paradigm case. What we're not as prepared for is what happens when we're on the periphery, when we're on the mm. coastline, where we don't have the knowledge that we, you know, about how to actually advance those those patients' interests. And because we don't have, you know, so if you ask, grab a clinician and say, tell me what medical ethics is, right? Like, tell me what your fundamental moral responsibilities are. And they're likely to say, well, first, I'm supposed to do no harm. Yes. And then I'm supposed to put the interests of patients above, yes, all you know, that. all other concerns, right? And, you know, and if I don't have the knowledge, I should consult the people who have it. And that that is a kind of a paradigm of knowledge transmission that presumes it's there somewhere. Yes. And you need to get it yes. from you know, the cons it's the consult conception, yes, right? You know, right. call, call the, call the yes, expert, call the expert. Um, but, yes. but when no expert has the knowledge, yes. then it's like, if, if you all, if you just stick with what you've got there, if you just stick with that list of values, you're going to dig yourself into a hole because you're going to say, I got to do what I think is best. And you have as many clinicians as there are good ideas. Yes running with their good idea because they think it's what's best. And if if what we say is not only do you have a duty to do that, right, um, but you have to be an independent expert and and go with what you think is, you know, with, with, with your independent judgment, then you wind up in this paradoxical situation where, you know, N experts with N different recommendations feel like they have to each go with their expert opinion, even though a super majority of their colleagues think that what they're doing is the wrong thing. <laughs> That's a, yes, right. That's very, this is very interesting. I was going to say that if you're in a situation where you don't know and no one is the expert, 
Well, that's when you just poll Twitter and you say, what does Twitter do? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> just, put that, just put that poll out there. No, okay, obviously that's right. Okay, so I mean, I think you really nicely talked about, I like this map metaphor. That's really good because most doctors live in the center of the map where, you know, you're treating care of chest pain and then, um, you know, uh, aortic dissection and then MI and then uh, appendicitis. And you know what, you know, you there's a lot of tradition. There's a lot of things that, uh, have randomized trials. There are a lot of data and there's a lot of practice and, and you're comfortable. Now you've got something you've never seen before. You could crank up the blood thinner. You could give hydroxychloroquine. You could give some HIV drugs. You could give tocilizumab. Um, interestingly, you always want to reach for like the most expensive drug. Nobody ever wants to reach for those older drugs. Anyway, that's, that's a side issue, but they, I don't know, uh, the tocilizumab, the JAK2 inhibitors, you know, try all that stuff. Um, anyway, you can, you can do that, but you don't know if you're going to make people better off or not. And I guess some of the other things that I think that are thorny problems are that we know from empirical data that on average, when there is something new and you try something, ra you know, that is plausible, the probability you're going to make people better off, it's not 50-50, it's actually rather, rather low. In fact, that's why drug development is fraught with failure. Um, and so, yep. so you're somebody who, who sees this space and you say the best thing you can do, the most ethical and parsimonious um, conduct is to rapidly... Um, Treat every patient in a way that generates the most information per patient you treat. And what that means is adequately powered randomized trials for the most part. Um, but when you look at the actual landscape, you find many, many um, uncontrolled studies, which are very challenging because you have a condition that, you know, 70% of people, 80%, 90%, you know, we're talking about hospitals, they're going to get better anyway. So oh, how do you know if it's 72%, if it was going to be 72, or if it should have been 82, you know, because it depends on their comorbidities. So uncontrolled is very, very difficult. And you saw centers, big centers with big people who are like actual knowledgeable people putting thousands of patients on uncontrolled studies. And you're like, my God, you're squandering this opportunity. You also saw the underpowered randomized trials. An underpowered randomized trial. I'm like, what are you even doing? I mean, it's like the noise is more than the signal. And, and then you saw the people, you saw this Martin Landre in um, Oxford just making us look like cave people. I mean, he's doing the recovery study. Every, every arm of that study is definitive. Every arm is, every arm is good because he got such sample size. It's randomized. It's so pragmatic. And I'm like, why are we not doing this? So, I mean, um, you wrote so that. Yeah, go, go ahead. The, well, so the, I just want to say, yes. I think, um, you know, recovery represents uh, the best of sort of lessons learned from uh, it, from the failures of Ebola in the sense that it was like, we, it's not just about um, doing something quickly. It's that we have to also be comprehensive, right? Um, and so the, the best thing about uh, recovery is that yes, it allows us to deploy the things when we don't know what's gonna work. It allows us to deploy the things that we think are gonna work, but it allows us to deploy them under circumstances where we can learn Right. Um, we can control for some confounding and we can see whether those signals of promise are genuine. And I share exactly what you the frustration that you have of hearing people say, you know, um, so many people that we've given convalescent plasma to have walked out of here. And you're like, you know, the background, we know very little about the natural history of this disease. You know, uh, a lot the, the majority of people who come you see are going to walk out, yes, exactly. uh, uh, are going to walk out. OK, I mean, the, so they, the potato chips that they ate in the waiting room, you know, are yes. also correlate with the, with people walking out while they're OK. Yes. Um, and as you put it, like our base rates are terrible. Nobody spends hundreds of millions of dollars to bring a drug to a phase three trial that fails because they think it's going to fail, yeah. right? I mean, everybody thinks they've all they've seen are is positive signal. They've got a theory that they believe in. There's a plausible mechanism. They've seen promising phase one and phase two evidence, and they bring we bring therapeutics to phase three, and about half of them fail at phase three. Even a phase so, three, right, right. And then the whole continuum, it depends on the subspecialty. Like Alzheimer's, like they're all failures. In oncology, it's like 6% success, and we have a very low bar for success too on the phase three side, right? Yeah, so I mean, these are low probably, like the best laid plans of mice and men off go astray in drug development. We know that. And so what do you think is going to happen with a new pandemic virus? Um, and, 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 and the other thing is, I mean, I was always just marveling at like, um, you know, like, like an antiviral medications. That's not like the, that's not like the, the great, I mean, there are a few really great antivirals, FC drugs, HIV drugs. There are a whole lot of viruses that we just do a lousy job of drugging EBV, CMV. I mean, it's not like a home run kind of space. Um, and so, 
um, you know, I was a skeptic of hydroxychloroquine, not because I had anything against hydroxychloroquine, but just like based on pretest probability that any um, uh, repurposed drug is going to work against any novel coronaviridae, my pretest probability is quite low. Um, you know, it's like a movie from a, a director I know I hate. I know I'm not going to like it so much, you know? <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, and that's that's how you approach it. Now, I wonder if I would add, I mean, I want to ask you about, um, you know, you're a philosopher, um, but you you obviously, I mean, I, I know you too. I've spent, you spent so much time thinking about the medical side of things. Um, I wonder, when did that start in your career? And how, like, how did that take off? And and do you ever not feel frustrated by doctors themselves? Do <laughs> you ever feel like, okay, I found some good ones? Yeah. Oh, yeah. so those are two really dangerous and okay. loaded uh, and loaded questions. I mean, um, I mean, just just by way of, um, you know, like like the 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 first part of like, you know, how did I get into this? Um, you know, I always started out interested in the ethical questions. And in graduate school, um, when John Aris, a very prominent bioethicist, was hired into our department, um, and I got the chance to do some TAing for him, actually, because I really wasn't interested in bioethics, because it, at the time in particular, and it still has this status, but at the time, it was really regarded as kind of a, a backwater of philosophy where you wouldn't <laughs> go if you were any good. Really? And mm. absolutely, yeah. I mean, the prejudices were very strong that if you really knew what you were doing, you'd go into meta-ethics. Um, and, um, and, and, and where were you so a graduate student at? University of Virginia, okay, um, which which at the time yes. was actually what like the place to be, one of the strongest places to be for medical ethics. Um, but um, but among the philosophers, it really wasn't regarded as a serious you know sort of undertaking. But sitting there and reading all this stuff, it just occurred to me like here were very concrete instances of of much more general philosophical problems whose structure people was you know, have been investigating for a long time, but this is a place where the rubber hits the road and where different solutions to those problems are going to matter. Um, so I, I became hooked, you know, immediately, uh, partly because I thought, here's where I can do the two things that I like. I, I can use the only life skill I have, which is sort of fundamental philosophical thought, but in a way that might actually turn a cog in some machine somewhere and do some good. Um, now I also now your question about doctors, right? Like so, my I had a very skewed conception of physicians as a as a young person because you know the the physicians that I knew were the parents of people that you know uh, friends of mine. They read James Joyce and they were you know sort of you know, intellectuals and researchers, and so I had this sort of sense of like doctors were more like. Um, um, Sherlock Holmes, right, mm, you know, kind of yes. doctor, right? You kind know, like polymath, right. polymath, yes. you know, with, um, and, and then it wasn't until I met a bunch of um, medical students uh, in graduate school that I had that image really kind of shattered. <laughs> uh, you know, um, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but it, so, but it, it ran the spectrum and, and, you know, in terms of, you know, like um, uh, of the depth with, to which people can be interested in various problems. Um, and so the, I, you know, to this day that, you know, the, the smartest people that I know are the people who work at kind of the foundations of their discipline um, and the foundations of medicine, you know, so I also a ancient philosophy was sort of the area I started out in and, and, you know, ph physicians play a huge role, you know, a lot of ancient philosophy and a lot of ancient ethics is, is bound up with sort of medicine and it's used as examples and, um, so that's probably a longer, longer no, I think story that's than you that's really hear, interesting. But... I mean, um, well, I don't know if you know this, but you know, I was my undergraduate major was philosophy, and uh, I ended up I was the commencement speaker for philosophy department in Michigan State. Um, and uh, and 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 of all the things that resonated with me in philosophy, um, you know, uh, I still have on my bookshelf like the complete writings of Plato, which I think uh, obviously all of footnote is, all, all of Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato, and it really is true. Um, and um, and Hume, I thought, was fascinating. Uh, just because of his rigor, I think. Um, although these days I hear, I you thought know, I, I thought I heard Hume is canceled. Is Hume canceled? Oh, uh, I, I don't, I don't. Well, there's, there's certainly a reckoning that we have to have with a lot of the, I see. I mean, the, the philosophers in the, in the, in the canon. I see. Uh, and the narrowness of the canon. I see. Um, but what I was, I was going to say, yes. you know, one of the first papers that I wrote was about the book one of the Republic, which yes. in which. 
Socrates uh, there talks about um, doctors practice two crafts, the art of medicine and the art of money making. And what should, how should those two crafts be related to each other? And, you know, the, the paper was about, well, what's the relevance of that for managed care? Yeah. Um, oh, and in a yes. certain sense, yes. you know, the, 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 those questions, right? How do we reconcile? And, and the, the medical research is the same sort of question. When we have multiple ends, the good of the patient, generating sound scientific knowledge. How do we reconcile uh, you know, making a profit. Drug companies want to make a profit. Like the the the, the actors, you know, researchers want to get promotion. Drug companies want to make a profit. You know, hospitals want want volume. Um, how do we take the these many different motives and reconcile them into systems that that promote the goods that we really want them to promote? That that's sort of what drives a lot of the research that that I do. Yeah. Well, good news for Socrates. We have now solved uh, book one of The Republic uh, by confluence of interest. That's what happens when you get paid by the drug company, you prescribe their drug, you write the guidelines, and you run the trial the way they want you to. It's a confluence. <laughs> <laughs> That's a confluence. Okay, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I, I, I want to make a, a point of saying, um, there are always some people on Twitter who um, say things that uh, I, I would not predict, and actually I'm like, huh, I didn't even... It was an entire angle of the problem I didn't think about, you know? And you're, you're always one of them. Whenever you, anyone's talking about anything from this one, drug, one vaccine shot to two vaccine shots, you say, here's one consideration that I thought about that just came to my mind, you know, you, you offer it. And I always, I always say, that's good. I mean, I, I really like that. I think, I mean, obviously it speaks to the fact that you're a, a thoughtful person, but also, I mean, that's, that's I, I guess as much as I hate Twitter, those moments are like the thing that keeps me going back for more is that occasionally somebody says something that I'm like, hmm, let me think about that. So I want to pick your brain about something, which I think is such an interesting issue. And I, and I, and I don't know how much you've thought about it because actually I don't see too many of your tweets on this topic, but I'm going to hold it up, this mask. Okay, the cloth mask. Okay, so this is a very interesting issue that brings together so many things that you think a lot about. One, public communication of science. Two, uh, evidence base of science changing over time. Three, the conduct of randomized controlled trials and their limitations. I mean, of the one randomized trial we've had, serious limitations on what you can extrapolate. Four, there's a, a political climate around this. Five, it's become polarized. It's become a symbol. It's almost like you wear one. I know you voted for Biden. You don't wear one. I know you who you voted for. I mean, it's really kind of crazy. Okay, so I guess I want to just see if you agree with me about some of these things. I mean, um, Early on in the pandemic, particularly in March, a number of um, major bodies, the US CDC, the WHO, um, respected authorities like Tony Fauci, um, said that universal cloth masks were not there. Um, the evidence is uh, circumstantial. It, uh, it, there's some conflicting evidence from influenza studies. Um, we don't advise it, um, to some degree in part that may be because of the uh, ongoing threat of uh, shortage for healthcare workers and a serious concern that you know people would, if they, want, if, if they were advised to wear this, they're going to snatch up the, the N95s that we so desperately needed. Um, okay, so that was the early that was early in March. Um, then of course, um, uh, the, 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 the guidance flipped, I believe in early April. Um, and then um, we weren't helped. Um, by, uh, I think, a, a very notorious political figure who um, made it a point to not wear them uh, publicly, perhaps to show strength or whatever. Um, and, 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 and this is somebody who stuck his, his finger in this problem a few times by extolling hydroxychloroquine, which is unhelpful, and, and by saying that he's not going to wear this, which further exacerbates tensions around this. Um, okay, um, so I don't know. I wonder... Okay, and, and, and then it goes on, and then, of course, then more and more people start to see the virtue of it. The evidence, I don't think, dramatically changed, but I do think that the precautionary principle is a reasonable principle, and, and I, of course, actually wear it. I think it's quite reasonable to wear. I wear pants, too. I, I don't have a randomized trial about wearing pants, but I wear them, and I wear the mask. Um, so, um, but then I saw on the other extreme, I do see some examples of um, fanaticism. And one example, Alex, I'll tell you about is just that, I don't know if you saw this, this was a doctor who um, lives and works in Southern Ohio, where the, the governor is actually quite decent. He passed a mask mandate. Um, and this doctor was shopping at a Home Depot and the other person in the Home Depot, Southern Ohio, so, you know, Kentucky border, not wearing a mask. The doctor goes to the Home Depot employee and says, that guy's not wearing a mask. You need to enforce the mandate. The employee, this like 22 year old kid who's probably paid minimum wage, this employee is like, you know, uh, Home Depot policy is yeah, like, we don't touch that. And um, the doctor was angry and goes to Twitter and says, we should cancel Home Depot. And, you know, it gets this outcry. Um, but my thinking was that, like, yes, him not wearing the mask, not good. Um, but confronting him may 
be potentially worse because he's going to scream at you and that's going to spray coronavirus in your face. And then you're going to call the cops and then he's going to pull his gun out. I mean, who knows what he's got? And then it's going to be instead of like uh, man didn't wear mask at Home Depot, the headline's going to read seven people shot in Home Depot over mask confrontation, which is, you know, probably what corporate Home Depot had thought about. And that's why they don't want this like poor little kid who's you know, has to work in the pandemic for Christ's sake because he's got to make ends meet. This poor kid uh, has to enforce this. OK, anyway, so I want I want I, so I'm curious, like. I mean, it was so much food for thought for a philosopher. Like, wh- where, what could we have done in communication early, in the middle? How would you suggest communicating now, now that, you know, people have dug in their heels on this issue? Um, I don't know, just any, and, and what do you think about the evidence base? I mean, just what are, how do you think about this? I mean, you could write a whole book on this one thing, I think. You, 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 you really, you, you absolutely could. Um, and, and I thought a lot about this, especially early on. Uh, and I think so for me, one of the interesting things that that masks illustrate is the difficult um, time that people in science have negotiating what's a science question and what's a value question. And so I think, um, you know, very early on, actually, um, you know, there were some of the some of the early studies that were done, not not studies, but just um, systematic reviews, right? Uh, and the National Academy, uh, you know, came out with a with a brief report, um, and I think there was one in the there was a piece in BMJ, um, you know, where where people were like, look, let's try to synthesize the evidence that we have, and you know, and so they were very clear, right, uh, in those early you know evidence synthesizing pieces that a lot of the evidence that we have is not directly relevant to what we're talking about, right? So the evidence that we have is for um, you know, masks that are, you know, like surgical masks or the N95 masks. Uh, we don't have a lot of, we didn't have a lot for these sort of homemade masks. Um, the evidence was for people who had been trained to wear them and in after a fit test. Yes. Uh, yes. And that doesn't really, like, that, that, that doesn't extrapolate to just the, you know, here, here's a mask and I don't know if it's your size and I don't know how you're going to wear it. Um, but a lot of those early, you know, uh, pieces, they were like, look, um, you know, so that what they created is, as it were, if you want another metaphor, there's sort of the ideal frictionless plane, like, you know, um, that sort of basic research, like how does the how does the material that the mask is made out of stop, uh, you know, the particulates that carry the, you know, the virus. Um, and if we make a mask out of that, it's going to stop, you know, the, the virus. Oh, because there's also the source source mitigation yes, versus, yes. you know, yes, right, you. you know, the yeah, protect, right. you know yeah. protecting you aspect. Right. Um, but I, I thought um, some of the early pieces did a better or a worse job at sort of saying, look, here's the science and here's what we know. And then at the end, there's this value question. Uh, and, and sometimes they were explicit about it being a value question. Sometimes they weren't. And the value question is, do the benefits of wearing the mask outweigh the risks of wearing it? Right. Yes. And there were, you know, early on, people thought there could be real risks if you think you're safer than you are because you're wearing like if you think you're being protected then you might you know take um you know riskier behavior risk right compensation um, yes that was the idea yeah. risk compensation exactly um and so but there i was very sympathetic to the idea that look um once you take everything into account um you know source mitigation maybe some protection for you uh it's a good idea to wear the mask it's low cost um, uh, and so the, the potential for benefit probably outweighs the, the burdens. You weren't persuaded um, by CO2 retention. You didn't think it's going to suffocate. <laughs> well, but here, here's the other thing though, yeah, right? Like, crazy you know, talk. the other thing is like yeah. when like clinicians wear these things for, I don't know, like what's the longest you wear, like a full shift, 18, right? Like, I know, mean, you 12, can wear for you know, 18 hours in a long OR case. Yeah. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're fine. You walk, you know, of course you're fine. <laughs> but and, and right. And so, you know, so, so the questions there were like, look, you know, there's, there's, what can we achieve when we have, you know, fit tests and people who wear them? And then what can we achieve for sort of just the general public? Yeah. And, and so another issue that yes. you raised is yes. one that really bothers me. And this is about like how we communicate risk or yes. how we communicate with the public. And in particular, um, should we tell the public the reasons why we want them to do something or not do something? Yes. Okay. So the the worry, right, that you know what we wanted the public not to do was go out and buy up all the N95. Correct. Right. That's what um, we wanted not to the, do. Yeah. Is the best way to achieve that by lying uh, to Deception. tell them yeah. that? Yeah. Right. To you know to tell them that we think masks aren't going to work. Um, I feel I have a strong opinion. <laughs> I've written about it, but yeah. Uh, I'm. What's your opinion? 
you're skeptical? I, I, my, I, my worry is that every time you lie to people, you you pollute, you lose. You lose the trust. The, the, you, you lose, lose the, the trust, and the then reservoir the, yeah, of, of trust. That's, and, there, and you don't get too many bites at the apple, and then you're done. I think two, to, two times you do that to somebody, you're done. They're never going to believe you again. I, I think that's right. Or then you wind up in the situation where people are trying to triangulate. So yes, they're they, like, well, here's what you're telling me, but what is it that you're really trying to get me to do? Right. Like, that's what I said. Um, and so when, when you're really, you know, like when you're like, look, don't take the bleach, right. You know, ble- bleach is, you can't inject or drink bleach. And they're like, well, is that because they don't want a shortage on bleach? Right. Like, yeah. You know, like, um, you know, you just never know. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, and I'm not, I don't mean by that to be, you know, I don't want to sound like, um, oh, I know what the straight route to scientific communication is, right? Just tell, you know, just tell people the unvarnished truth. Um, um, you know, I, I, you have to tell people information in a way that they're going to understand it. And, and I get that um, oftentimes people make decisions not necessarily entirely on what you tell them. Yes. Um, you didn't read my, I, I mean, I had, think, I had an op-ed yeah. on Fauci and I think that um, it was because of that, that herd immunity comment where he was saying he, I mean, it essentially kind of made it seem like that there's a range of herd immunity thresholds that are plausible. I mean, we don't know the exact answer. And he was basing where he was saying it in part based on his reading of polls as to what percent of Americans would take a vaccine. And I think, and then he admitted that to a New York Times reporter. I was like, even if you're doing that, keep that to your damn self. Why are you admitting it? But he admitted it to the Times reporter. I was like, that's too much. I was like, that's, that's crazy. Um, uh, but, and then I wrote a thing saying that that's a risky game to play. When you calculate what people will do in response to what you're doing, and you're supposed to be a neutral scientist, one, you know, they're not going to trust you. Two, they're going to play that game, that translator game. They're going to put everything you say through their little translator to say, well, what does he really mean? What does he really think? What's the really truth? And, and once you go down that road, you can lead to a lot of very dangerous ideas um and 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 then ultimately i think i guess the challenge is um and i'm curious to get you to talk about this a little bit which is that i'm like scientists we're wonderful i mean i view myself as one i hope i don't know if i'm they throw me out after all this but i mean i view myself as one um but our goal is to talk about what are the possibilities in scenario a scenario b scenario c but i really think you need the public you need everybody all disciplines to really inject the values into that and if scientists um give you science wanting you to do something, we are taking your autonomy, your values, and we're putting our own values in place of that and telling you what you ought to do. Um, and so that troubles me as well, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I, I, um, I mean, in the sense that I, uh, you know, the, the descriptive questions, uh, right, um, that science is, is supposed to answer, it, it, those only go so far in terms of feeding into what the decision is. And then the decision has to be, um, the decisions that people make are a weighing of risks and benefits. Um, I think things get complicated in public health crises because the model that um, I should be free to make my decision for myself, right? So like in a medical model, yes. um, right? You know, you can tell me what, the risks and benefits are of having or not having this procedure. And if I have it or not have it, you know, generally I bear those consequences. Yes. yes. And, and no one and, else. And it's your, yes. Right. And, and it's your job to help me understand, right. Um, what those consequences are and make sure that I, I comprehend them so that, so that, um, you know, at the end of the day, I can say, yeah, come what may, right. I'm willing to, um, you know, live with the consequences of the choices that I make. That's very different in a public health yes. um, uh, crisis where the decision that I make also implicates the health and the welfare of other people. Absolutely. And I think um, Americans are genetically disposed to to react negatively to anything, uh, you know, that requires a solidarity <laughs> and collective action. Yes, especially recently. But wait, I, OK, I, I want to come to that in a second. Um, but I want to have you finish. So, I mean, let's say you are the mask czar right now, like you're in charge of communication for the Biden team. How, what would you tell, what would you tell them? How should they be communicating around this? What should they tell the public? I mean, I don't know what the polls are now, but you know, there's a lot of people who are going to do it. You got them already. There's a bunch of people who are, I don't know what they believe in. They're not going to do it no matter what you tell them. There's some people maybe who can flip a few votes. So, I mean, I guess how, what would you advise, how do you advise that question? Like, what was your do you, do you play the do you play the um this is a patriotic duty card do you play the this is for other people the altruism card i mean 
I don't know. How do you? How? What, what's your? What's your? What's your magic answer? No, I mean, I know. I mean, I, 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 what, so let me let me say two things about yes. that. Like just for like directly to answer your question, I'm I'm a fan of diversity and uh, I'm willing to let a thousand flowers bloom in that mm. sense. Like so, let let some people make the patriotic appeal. Uh, uh, let other people make the appeal to altruism. You know, let other people make the self interested. You know, yes. uh, 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 you know, appeal. Um, because you, you never know, as long as they're, um, well done, you never know where, which of those messages is going to stick. Um, and I, I, what I think though, what we've done is we've, we've driven ourselves into a, a, a hole that it's going to be very hard to dig ourselves yes, out I of think so too. and right. And so, yeah. you know, I think that the real opportunities, I mean, this isn't, you know, but the real opportunities were missed early on yes. where, where really what we needed was. Uh, and and it's and it still boggles my mind that that we didn't react this way, right? That this virus is going to infect you regardless of what you think of the Federalist Papers, yes. re regardless of what you've got yes. in your four hundred one k, you know, like. Um, and so the idea that we couldn't get together and say, listen, we all need to take this basic set of precautions to try to uh, tamp this thing down, uh, right? And you know, like here's the strategy that we want to take as Americans, right? Mm -hmm. um, like we're not asking you to get on a troop transport and r and rush the beach at Normandy. We're asking you to wear a mask, you know, wash your hands. So a, the fact that we couldn't get bipartisan support for that is is incredibly, um, you know, uh, you know, frustrating. Um, and and I think it speaks to a public culture where the desire to have a a uh, whip to flog your enemy is so great that it transcends the desire to avoid outcomes that are bad for you, the, the, the people that you regard as in your tribe, and the people that you regard as outside of your tribe. It's, I it's I, really mind boggling. I couldn't say it better myself. And I think to some degree, the school's issue is a similar thing um, we, we could talk about. But I guess I also think just on this point, um, if it were the first year of his presidency instead of the the penultimate, if it were a different president, um, somebody who we you may not like if you're not on the same side, but you but doesn't really get under your skin so much. And the fact that like a fate of a nation dealing with a pandemic is contingent on these two things, where it falls in, a, in an election cycle and how polarizing the person is. It's scary to me. I mean, I mean, I because I really do think if it was if it was the first year of an Obama presidency or a George W. Bush presidency, it would have been so much more so different. Um, we there would have been a lot more solidarity. Uh, there there wouldn't have been undermining of advisors and things like that. Um, and and that's I don't know that that's the sad part to me. I mean that that political dysfunction, which I think is bad, can be so bad that it results in an inordinate loss of life. Um, and, and, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah. The other thing yeah. I wanted to say yes. about the, just sort of the shotgun blast yes, of yes, things yes. That, you, yeah. that, you, that you raised, well, is, um, so it, it's an issue that sits in a different constellation of issues where, where I sort of, but it's a nexus of things I work on, which is, you know, sort of the relationship between, um, well-designed, properly controlled clinical trials and other methods of learning. Okay. So this could be machine learning and AI, you know, uh, you know, observational stuff, whatever. And when it comes to the mask issue, part of it is, um, so as someone who is trying to advocate for um, um, learning health systems more broadly, right, you know, conducting more clinical trials and stuff, I'm still very much aware that there's a limit to the number of trials that, that we can run and that you have to prioritize, um, right? What, what are the things that you're going to dedicate the time and the energy and the resources to studying with sort of the, 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 the most reliable methods? Right. And then after you've done that, what do you do for the other questions right. that are kind of, you know, that remain on the table? And, um, and so, you know, I, I, wor I worry that the mass question, you know, doesn't really fall into the, uh, you know, or I, I guess I should say, you know, would the mass question fall into the we need to run a well-designed controlled trial, um, you know, or is it the sort of thing where we say, um, you know, the we should go with the precautionary principle, you know, uh, you know, wear these things and put our energies into studying the other things that we think are going to make a bigger impact on 
you know, on the, um, you know, on, on our ability to uh, make progress in the, in the pandemic. And where do you fall? I guess, I guess, I guess, well, I guess let me make a case. Okay. Um, hypothetically, let's say we were a country that knew how to do trials like recovery. I guess I would say, um, you know, I could imagine like a cluster randomized trial early in the pandemic. You'd have to do it early. I mean, I think that, so that's part of all of this is that like, I don't know, now the, the jello has solidified and I don't know what shape it's in, but it is what it is. Um, but if you were in March and you did a cluster randomized trial, like I wouldn't want to do, I wanted to do more than this, this like the cloth mask. I would be like, um, one County cloth mask, uh, maybe, uh, or some counties cloth mask, some County surgical mask. Um, and then, uh, sort of as a factorial design face shield, no face shield, um, ubiquity of hand sanitizer when you go to like Safeway or, you know, giant or whatever, you know, grocery stores. Um, but there were a number of non-pharmacological invent- interventions that could reasonably, I think, have been studied. Um, of course, I mean, we could, you know, we could do a whole couple hours on like all the barriers that exist to this trial. But I guess you would say that, you know, one could have had a precautionary principle in some places and be running this trial in other places, and you wouldn't be not, you would not be opposed to such a strategy. No, not at all. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't at all. I mean, and in fact, I, you know, the the general take home message is the time to address uncertainty this way is. Early. Uh, as early as possible. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's it, it. So that's why I said, on the one hand, we learned that lesson, and we mounted a lot of studies. Uh, the problem was we mounted a lot of like, un, unlike recovery, and a few other, you know, studies that everything else was kind of, it, it reflects the individualism of entrepreneurs, yeah, right? Well, yeah. here are the resources that I got available. Uh-huh. I'm going to run a small study, you know, it's what was feasible for me. And, and that gets back to, well, you know, is what's feasible for you adequate for the purposes that we rely on in uh, research for, namely to give the information that stakeholders need to make momentous decisions. Um, and those two things, like a, a lot, a lot, a lot of small studies don't necessarily amount to one much larger or several right. much larger, you know, better quality studies. Right. Um, okay. Let me ask you this question. This is related, but also... I don't know. It's a philosophical question, and I don't have a good answer, so I'm going to ask you because you're smarter than me. Um, uh, there are clearly some pieces of information that are uh, very horrible, and if you allow them to circulate in the minds of people, a lot of bad shit is going to happen. For instance, that pizza parlor gate, whatever happened a few years ago, even what happened in the Capitol a couple of days ago. I mean, if you let people tell people on Facebook and Twitter that this was a fraudulent election and it was stolen from us and it's rigged and we have to insurrect, uh, don't be surprised when a mob storms the Capitol. I mean, okay. Um, so so there are these harmful messages. Um, and obviously there's a spectrum. Um, there are some other messages that are um, uh, we may just simply disagree about. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Uh, John Unides early in the pandemic has a YouTube video. He says the, in, the, the uh, uh, infection fatality rate of SARS-CoV-2 is, quote, in the same ballpark as, end quote, flu, seasonal flu. Some se- I think he said some seasonal flus made it even a little more. Okay, so what is a ballpark? I was like, I don't know. It's a ballpark 0. 0.1, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.4. Is a ballpark 0. 0. 0.1%? I don't know what's a ball. I mean, it's a ballpark. Um, Carl Hennigan, he, he read the Danish mask study which is a very, you know, it's a, it's a several thousand person randomized study. Um, it failed to find a 50% reduction in individual acquisition of the virus. It was unable to test whether or not my virus protects you because it's not a cluster trial. And it was unable to exclude a 15% reduction in individual risk because it doesn't have the power. Um, so Carl Hennigan wrote an article in The Spectator, and it says as the headline, um, masks fail to significantly reduce transmission which I think is technically what it showed, although can can be construed as an anti-mask message at a time where you want people to do it. Um, and Facebook labeled that fake news. YouTube ripped down John Unity's video. So I guess my question is this, and it's a question I've thought a lot about, and I actually, I, even though I've written a little bit about it, I don't know if I can draw the line. But is there a, I mean, how do we separate, like we're not talking about government censorship here. We're talking about private company censorship, like Facebook and Google. They have a lot of, I mean, for better or worse, we can debate whether or not they should have such an oversized role in our society, but they do, and they're a private company, so they can delete whatever they want off their platform. Um, where do we draw the line in terms of, and who should decide, really? I mean, should it be the employees of these companies deciding, or should it be the public? Um, which messages out that are that are potentially misleading and false are harmful, 
like the Storm Capital event, which messages are within the realm of what scientists should be allowed to say and argue, potentially the ballpark comment, potentially this, this Danish mask study interpretation. Um, how do we decide that? Who decides that? How do you, your thoughts? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, there, there are, there are ton, too many things, too many things to say. Okay, so, okay. Um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to stay more like sort of narrowly focused on, so uh, on, uh, in, in terms of, um, so I, I know that, 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 that you, um, you know, reacted very strongly against the, 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 um, the, the, the pushback or the, um, uh, I guess, so I would say the pushback against Ionides, um, yeah. I, you, you I could also that. say, you know, um, you know, that, uh, so I know that you felt that it, it went, uh, it, it became personal at, at a certain point. Yes. Um, when they said his, his ugly white suit, I was like, okay, come on. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But, but no, okay, I mean, okay. certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the, like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the, 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 yeah, yeah. whether you like that kind of, you know, uh, my man from Havana, kind of orthogonal to, yeah. yes, you know, to, to, you know, the quality of the advice that, you know, that you're getting. Yeah. Um, yeah. um, but, you know, so there, yes. I think what, like, it's, it's certainly the case that, um, uh, that uh, we don't want discourse, scientific discourse or the discourse about like, you know, what we ought to be doing about, the, you know, the pandemic to sort of devolve into, you know, white, white suit bashing, right? If you want to put it that way. Uh, on the other hand, though, um, I think that there was a fair amount of frustration from people who looked to John, uh, you know, at, at looked to, um, you know, John Ionides as a, as a figure of, uh, you know, who has a leadership role, uh, you know, in the field, who's done, you know, a lot of important, a lot of work, a lot of important work. Um, and we're, we're worried that some cases where if you, if, if you took that guy five years ago and showed him the work that, that was coming out uh, now, right. uh, a blinded. He'll be critical uh, that, of it. That, that, that guy would have been all over it, right? right? right, right, right. Um, and so when you've internalized that guy, you have your own little, you know, uh, John Ineed is sitting on your shoulder and he's, you know, uh, reading these papers um, and, you know, and is sort of, you know, go, being apoplectic. Then you start to worry, wait a minute now, like what, where is the double standard? Um, and, and so I think some of it reflected people's frustrations at, we need to uphold the very norms of rigor that you are sort of a champion of. And, uh, and then when we don't see that it's fair game to then say, wait a minute, right? Uh, like, um, uh, you know, stage one was, let me show you why I think there are a lot of problems with what you're saying. Stage two now is, it, um, because I feel like you haven't done due diligence, I can blame you. Hmm. Um, and, and I think, look, there, there is a real question, right, in the marketplace of ideas, uh, if your ideas don't stand up to the, exactly the kind of substantive scrutiny that we're talking about, um, and in particular, if people feel like you haven't sort of done the due diligence that you are capable of doing, given the, the mound of prior work, you know, that you're sitting on, then some amount of, um, um, you know, uh, the expression of displeasure is sort of the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the legitimate consequence of that. And so I, I, de I definitely don't think that we want to encourage, you know, the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, Twitter mobbing when, when it can happen for, you know, you know, r ridiculous reasons and things like that. But I, but I also think, um, that there, there is a difference between people expressing their disappointment uh, that is a reflection of their sense of what the merits of the work really is. Um, now, I'm not a scientist, right? I mean, so... so uh, Don't you know, wash I, your hands I, of this. I, no, but okay, I, 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 I want to come back to the censoring. I guess the only thing I would say about that is, which I think is fair, I mean, because I guess the specific, some of the specific errors in Santa Clara, the original preprint, were errors. I mean, there's no way around it. Uh, the false positive rate, the confidence interval calculation. But the only thing that I, I, I haven't checked the footage, but maybe someday somebody will, is in the order of events, the time that elapsed from the stat, I think March 17th op-ed where he voiced sort of a critical tone about the policy and the Santa Clara was a couple of weeks. And I think even in those two weeks, 
um, the the hostilities were were st- were brewing. Like in other words, I I guess I, I I mean I don't mean to discount your claim because I think it's true that that piece of work had flaws when it was published or when it was preprinted and um, highlighted. Um, but I wonder if the the backlash had already started a little bit before. But I guess I I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. But I guess my question. But what about the censoring question? Okay, so now he goes on. Tw- I mean, let's say. Um, he he goes on uh, YouTube and he makes his video, um, and then they, the the video's done. Like you can't you can't watch the video. It's like pulled off the platform. So I mean I mean you can make a fair argument that like well the the thing that um, I think the impetus for the video may have been a study that had these structural flaws. Ergo, the person saying that ballpark figure um, you know might have deceived their own thinking. Um, but the flip side is you know if if we if we started deleting videos of everybody who used bad data to come to a conclusion there would be none of us none of us would be left in this business cuz a lot of that no you know you know what i mean so like so how do you think about that i mean like cuz now you're getting big tech the people who are doing it in big tech it's like you know a bunch of um you, probably younger people who have graduated with graduate degrees and they're the ones who are asked to police this it's not i i don't envy the job i mean i'll be i'll be honest with you and actually as as critical i mean as as much as i try to preserve a debate I'm not sure if I mean there may be some line. I actually I don't I don't discount that. I don't know the line. How do you think about like that quest that level? Not, so it's not just people saying like your paper is shitty. Um, it's it's the next step of where your paper is gone. Poof, you know. Yeah, I mean, look, part of what the science the scientific process, the exchange of ideas, the contest of ideas, um, right, is is partly about winnowing out ideas that are. Um, more fecund, that are more useful, that are um, that can stand up to, to scrutiny and tests. Like there's lots of different criteria, but it's a winnowing process. And you know, um, and so it's true. Peer review is of um, you know. Uh, I mean, I know there's there's controversy about the relative value of peer review, whether that's the right way to you know to put a filter on things. And I think that the experiment with sort of well, let's put blast things out to the public before peer review has been has 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 been informative in important ways because it's a double-edged you know, sword it's a double-edged sword it's yeah. a double-edged sword and so look i mean so one aspect of that that sort of is lurking under the surface here and that some of my colleagues who do philosophy of science um you know uh you know think about is that you know science isn't entirely like look the goal of science is to get to the truth but sometimes you know we get to the truth not necessarily by going directly for it right in the sense that People want, uh, they want money, they want profit, they want credit, they want, you know, lots of things that drive them uh, to do the science that they do. And I think with the preprint stuff, what you saw is if you change the ecosystem so that you get to blast your message to the media before it goes to the filter of what your colleagues, of the assessments of your colleagues, that you can get people who are like, look, I can grab the headlines, you know, uh, for a day. Uh, and 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 grab a bunch of, of you know utility points, right? You know, like publicity points, likes, you know, retweets, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, you know, grab you know reputation for a while, and and what I'm left with after the peer review, and I have to walk everything back. I might still be in a net positive, and so in that sense, I think it created an ecosystem where it, people could sort of the self-aggrandizement could come at the expense of the science. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what the, whether it's better to double down on peer review, you know, uh, mm-hmm. you know what the alternative is, I, 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 I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I think that some of, you know, some of the, the stuff about, you know, when papers are retracted or, or what <clears> things should be taken down, I think some of that is a legitimate reflection of, um, you know, we're moving by we're moving past ideas, we're moving past contributions. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the people who had those contributions are also moving past them. I mean, if you think about science and scientific progress, it's not always the case that literally everybody says, you know what? Um, This is the, the this new idea is better and we're all moving to it. Right, right. It may be that that a bunch of people they're doubling down on the old ideas right right, right, i mean they're sticking with it and they die off because those people don't get grants anymore they don't get students anymore you know they retire and it's just like they just sort of become quiet 
and the ideas that have, you know, that are, that have more, you know, fecundity, right. More, you know, have legs yes, more that are more fecund. useful, right. you know, they, they attract more of the attention. And so I think in a certain sense, what Twitter and social media do is they show us sort of right up front, you know, that sort of process of like, do we, how much of a platform do we want to give to people who are like, if you add another epicycle to my theory, it's, it's much better than the old version of the it. The Ptolemaic right? model. Great reference. <laughs> Um, so I guess I'd say, I mean, I love what you're saying. I mean, I guess I would say like, um, I mean, I agree with you fundamentally that philosophy, I mean, that all of us in the Academy, to some degree, we're in a marketplace of ideas. We're making our ideas. We're packaging our ideas. We're like many of us. We just take the same damn idea and we just shape it this way, shape it that way, shape it this way, shape it that way. One of these days, these people are going to like my idea. Um, I said, and I agree with you. And I think we have to have that competition. And I think the, I mean, I, if you look at like the readership of journals, it's like this spike in this like huge long tail of, you know, tail of obscurity. Um, I, so I totally agree. And I spend a lot of time thinking like it's not it's important to do really good science. It's also important to tell it in a compelling way that doesn't distort it or doesn't sensationalize it, but just tells it in a way that does connect it and simplify it and explain to people why it's important. Um, and so I agree with you that like bad ideas and people if they disagree and if they people think that the study is shitty, that you should push it away. I guess the only thing I think is attention is like the bar between just ignoring it and letting it go versus like just poof disappearing it. And even retraction, I think, you know, when they pull it. That's another can of worms because these days the, um, there are many articles that are flawed. Not all get retracted. It's like a rare event to happen. Uh, it's the two hit hypothesis of all the lousy articles. They second hit on a few. Um, and I guess I would say that um, I'm fine with retracting articles when they merit retraction. Um, sometimes I worry that we're retracting articles because we don't like the message the article sends um, from a social perspective. Um, it affects our sensibilities. We don't like that political message, um, even if the article technically doesn't have anything too wrong with it. But that's another story. Um, retraction I'm fine with because even in retraction, they don't poof it. It doesn't vanish. It's it's there. You can still read it, but it's got retracted all over it. Um, but anyway, I wanted to shift to something that you you made me think about. Twitter experts. So, like this is a very interesting idea you're talking about this like natural selection, you know, this idea this this um battle place of ideas. And and it's always existed in the academy. That's why some people's papers are two people who did very similar isn't it, that Alfred North Russell and Darwin wrote very similar things, but Darwin's is just presented in a way that you know, uh, even though he was published af after, I think, Russell, uh, you know, that it, it just took off. He gets a lot more of the credit. Um, and so it, you get credit both for being first and also for being um, parsimonious, I think, in science. Um, um, but the way in which we are changed the commodity of ideas is we've inserted Twitter. Um, and there are a lot of people who are very thoughtful scholars on Twitter who have gained, I think, significant followings. And there are a lot of people who have, who are, um, they're, they're simulacra of thoughtful scholars. Uh, uh, they're not Harvard professors, but they were once at Harvard. They, you know, I used a restroom in Carnegie Mellon, so I'm a Carnegie Mellon-esque kind of person. Um, I've, I've got the trappings of it. Um, and I might even be 80% pretty good, 80% of the time. That's the right summary of the study. That's the right summary of the study. That's the right summary study. Um, I may use a lot of caps, capital letters, a lot of GIFs or GIFs, however the hell you want to call it. I don't know what the hell it is and I don't want to use it. Um, but anyway, I use the GIFs and I use the GIFs and, and, and I don't want to, I mean, I want, I have to admit that I guess I think I'm better than the average person at Twitter, but I ain't a pro. I mean, I'm not as good as the best. I'm not, I'm not coming with the best clickbait. Um, so my question to you here is, is about is in some, to some degree, is the battle of ideas n different than it was before? Or is this merely the process that was always there? Like people were always drawn to the sensational. Um, and I've heard some scientists say this, like the Dr. So-and-so, this eminent oncologist, he, he just does clickbait, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, is there something different to it? Is it different in kind or different in degree? Or are we just seeing it on a faster time scale? Um, how do you feel about it when you see the things that go viral and the things that don't? I mean, <laughs> I... I turn to my historian friends and I'm and I'm always like when the when the printing press came out and all of a sudden like you could mass manufacture stuff, you know, were, were people like, have you seen what this has done to yes, yes, literature? Yes. Like, yes, you it's know, garbage. now anybody can put out a pamphlet, yes. you know, saying, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, whatever they want. And it's really it's ruined the quality of literature. Yes. And it, it's like the thing. And I think there was a fair amount of that. Yes. And so I think we have a difficult time transcending you know, we romanticize the past um, uh, and and selectively describe it in the ways that we that we would like it to have been. 
um, whether whether it was that way or or not. Um, you know, I think I do think a lot about Twitter mostly because I feel the the allure of the dark side of of Twitter, right? Like there is something about the neurochemistry of you know when you get a bunch of likes and and you know especially if positive things like you know if people are like you know share your your paper and people like the paper that's like oh wow that's great and I would love to get more than that and then I think I've seen some pretty sad things of people chasing that um, high <laughs> or whatever yes, right I think um, it is, yeah. you know on. On, on, on Twitter. And so in, in that sense, I think it, it can lead people who have a, an expertise, you know, a, 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 a relatively narrow, but very deep expertise to move off of that. Um, you know, when there are a lot of celebrity, um, you know, people who are, you know, sort of they're, they're, they're great at, at, you know, modeling one sort of thing, like maybe an election. Um, and then, you know, they're like, well, I can add and, and I like spreadsheets <laughs> and probabilities. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of colonize public health and epidemiology now. Right. And, and, and that person like, was oh. great at modeling one election. And then the next one blundered it colossally. <laughs> and nobody talks about that. Yeah, I know. Um, but, but, you yeah. know, but there's a drive they, yes. like there, there's a drive for like, I got to provide content, right? Like, you know, I, I, I you know, the, the, those people, I, it's like their, their livelihood is partly yes. tied up with like sort of being in front. And the problem is, they can suck the air out yes. of out of the room. And so I think on the one hand, the best thing about Twitter is there can be people who they, they didn't go to Harvard, right? You know, they, they're not, you know, at, uh, you know, at the top of whatever the, the relevant hierarchy is, but they're smart and they can provide an insight yes. that you might have missed. Yes. And it's fresh and it's interesting. And it's like, that's awesome. Yes. Um, you know, there's it, there can also be so much noise and the and the recapitulation of things. And when you have this salience bias, you know, where you think, oh, you're getting 500 different people saying the same thing. And it, you don't it does. It's not clear to you that that's because there's a common cause. Each of those 500 people are retweeting the same cup, you know, uh, same couple of ideas. So you're really just hearing from a couple of real sources. It's not genuine sort of, you know, uh, confirmation or something like that. Um then it can create, you know, an epistemic environment that's overwhelming. And, it, and I think what you see with what we see with the issue of the misinformation, yes. right? Misinformation, like, I think it's the same people like the feeling of like, they're in on something new, they've got an insight. And, you know, we know that misinformation can spread more quickly than actual facts, because they're more mundane. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, so I, I, I've seen the good of Twitter in terms of like, I, I stay there because I see people's work that I wouldn't otherwise have right. seen. You know, there are people who put out threads that are, you know, genuinely like, ah, I could, I may not have been able to fully digest your paper, but your summary of the paper gives me a window into it that's really helpful. Yes. So, um, and then, you know, I, then I think um, it's also, there's a lot of morality play, you know, lessons about hubris and mm -hmm. like, you know, if the Greeks were, were still in the business of writing, um, you know, uh, uh, um, um, what do you call it? fables yes. or parables or, yes. you know, they, they'd mostly be about, uh, you know, what happens on Twitter. <laughs> I, I, uh, I agree. I agree with so much of what you said. Um, I think that, um, some of the things I've observed is that the sort of people who I think end up chasing the followers, one of the characteristics I've seen is that a feed that was mostly about um, science or medicine, or I, I say that only because that's the space that I'm in and that I follow, um, increasingly becomes political. Um, and to some degree, I think, of course, science and medicine are politics. They are related to politics and public health is political. Um, but when it becomes more naked politics, um, I think it may be because the person genuinely feels that those issues are important. It's also, I think, there's nothing that drives followers on that website like just naked politicking. I mean, if you pick one person or the other and you just go full steam ahead, you're going to get more followers in a fortnight than you've ever had in your life. I mean, just because that's just what the market, I mean, so it's rewarding you for talking about those issues. Um, and the more strident you are one way or the other, uh, anything in the middle for, on politics, of course, you're just, you could, nobody has patience for that. You're not going to get any, I mean, you're going to not do as well. Um, I wonder if, like, um, you know, the, the, this, the, we started the conversation, and I think we're going to have to finish soon, but we started the conversation about a space that you and I have a lot of experience in, we thought a lot about, which is um, individual level decision making in biomedicine, how we ought to do that, and how we ought to generate evidence to empower that. Um, and then a lot of what has happened in the last year 
is not individual level decision making, it's population level decision making. It's not just biomedicine, it's all of life from education to um, love and, 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 and people getting you know, divorced and financial life and jobs and livelihood and, and health and well-being and the death of your loved ones potentially. Um, unlike the, where we started, where we have so much track record to like hang our hat on years of scholarship and um, we've studied it and we've looked at it this way and that way. And I remember it took me years before I came to the opinion that you so nicely said. I mean, that's exactly where I have come to, but I wasn't there on day one. I don't think I was there until I was like eight years into medicine before I was even close to where you are right now. Like it took me a while to get there. But with the COVID pandemic, no one has had eight years of thinking about these issues. We've had eight minutes and we got to get there to should we, how should we mandate masks? How should we close playgrounds? How should we open businesses and economy? Um, and then the last part of it is um, the uncertainty bounds, I think are bigger. Um, and, and. I guess one of the things I noticed on Twitter was somebody was lamenting the fact that, um, you know, the great Barrington Declaration authors, and of course, you know, we can talk about it. I think it has, it's not a perfect declaration, obviously. I think it has like flaws. Um, but they were saying like that they were surprised that professors at Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard felt this way to write this declaration when they were on the Jon Snow side of things. And I guess I wanted to say like, um, I mean, I fully appreciate that you can disagree and that I fully appreciate that um, their proposal may result in greater loss of life. I mean, that's entirely um, within reason. But I guess I'm not surprised that they reached it for some of these structural reasons, that the threat, that, that the threat is new, that it affects everything, every domain, that all of us are approaching this question with different weighings in our mind of how important these different domains are, um, that the uncertainty bounds are very great. So I think it was inevitable that some professor at one of these places is going to feel differently than another professor at one of these places. Um, and I, I don't know. So I guess, I, I don't know if that's a question at all, but I, I guess I'm curious what that makes you think about. Yeah. Well, so I think the, the thing, so one of the things that you're mentioning that's disorienting is that um, I, I think in normal circumstances, we rely on a division of labor. Like you specialize in you know one area of oncology and and then you know the work that you produce it feeds out you know there are people who do regulatory science who consume what you do and there are people who are clinicians at the bedside who consume what you do and there are people who are trialists who consume what you do and so there might be a little network you know of you know um of tributaries that your work connects to um but those connections are based on like what's the comparative advantage of the of the work you know uh, that you do in this relatively limited space, and and that's how it is for 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 everybody, right? Like you know, they, you you specialize, your work feeds into you know various other things. Well, with the pandemic now, it, it because um, you know these medical decisions are also public health decisions, yes. and these public yes. health decisions are influencing education. Yes. Um, you know your ability to travel. <laughs> it's literally the ramifications go through all of life. Yes. Yes. Those yes. narrow silos, yes. right? The, yes. the, the narrow silos can't contain it. Can't contain it. Yeah. And so, so it's valuable to then get people's narrow silo perspective on the big picture, yes. um, but it can also run out. So here's the thing that's always bothered me with the, the, the cure is worse than the disease line, which is, you know, what's the alternative? Like, tell me what the baseline is against which you're telling me that the cure is worse than the disease. Right, right. I, I, I'm all for the, the, like the reality, don't get me wrong here, like anytime in medicine, in, in, in public policy, anytime you intervene, there are going to be good things and bad things that result, <laughs> right? And, um, uh, and there'll be directly and, and you know, ancillary, uh, um, you know, uh, effects. Um, but the, the idea that we're going to let the pandemic just run wild and that people are going to continue to go to work and go out to restaurants and, and, and that the economy is going to stay strong as you know, our caseload is you know uh, is is shooting up. Um, that didn't stri that doesn't strike me as as the right counterfactual. Right, and, and so in fact, the I think there are plenty of examples of even if you do nothing, people are not going to go and do those things if they don't feel comfortable or they feel scared. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. exactly. That's right. not yeah, just exactly. simply not, the counterfactual of no restrictions is people stay in their house looking out, looking at the TV saying, Jesus Christ, how many people are dying here? I'm not going out there. Um, just let me finish that, finish that point though, right? Because I think, you know, the, the, the worry there was, 
what's confusing is it's actually not clear what the default baseline is uh, because the mm -hmm. default baseline isn't just let it run wild. It's look, what's the policy response that we're going to mount to this? And I think part of the problem that's been really disorienting is that the public health professionals that you would go to to say, what really should we do? They would tell you we should do uh, not just lockdowns, but then lots of things after we knock down the, the virus. And then what did our political leaders do? Right. Um, th there wasn't a co we're not seeing the consequences, I think, of a coherent public health strategy that has played itself out. What we're seeing is, you know, um, saying one thing, doing other things, uh, not mounting a coherent strategy led from the federal government down. So states have been kind of left to do it on their own individual school districts like i've sat on yeah. two thousand person calls where the the members you know my my fellow community members are trying to figure out like how are we going to respond to the pandemic in our local school district without a whole bunch of guidance from the the, the experts that are out there you know uh, to provide it so so part of that is just it's disorienting to have so many different aspects wrapped up into one. And part of the worry is, you know, um, uh, when people say, look, um, I'm questioning your judgment about the effects of one strategy, but relative to a baseline where we're not really sure what the baseline is and what the evidence is for their claim that that baseline is gonna be worse, um, then I think it just proliferates, you know, not just the uncertainty, but the acrimony um, because people feel like they're not being heard. Um, and that's because the assumptions that are structuring the debate are so radically different on on some of these sides. That's well put. I mean, I, I it, it's very well put. And I think one of the challenges that you alluded to about that um, that public health response of we want to do these things and a whole bunch of other things, test, trace, isolate, and find all this stuff, is the political reality that when you start doing these things to help people who are marginalized on the uh, who don't have a lot of money you have to inject a lot of capital and give it to people who are poor not just people not people who just have, own a lot of stock and we happen to be at a time where the people in power don't like giving money to people who don't have it they like giving money to people who have a lot of it and that is a that's a problem uh, i don't know what to say i think that's a problem in peace and in war and that was a big problem here um but anyway, it's a, a, to be honest, a lot of the issues are so big, I can't even conceptualize them. The school issue is something I feel I can kind of wrap my mind around a little bit because I'm start, you know, I have a sense of, of, of the school's issue, but all of these broader issues I have not even commented or weighed in on because I don't feel like my brain is big enough to hold it all. Um, um, anyway, but, um, but I appreciate your, your thinking on this. Um, I guess I will, uh, I'll give you the last word, but I just want to tell listeners that, you know, they should follow you, obviously. Um, and um, I think uh, I think because you 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 um, you think well, but you also think a little bit differently than a lot of people who work in this space because you have different uh, background and interests and and uh, and approach things with a different sort of frame of mind. Um, and I, yeah, I really I really appreciate getting a sense of how you think through these things. Um, and I uh, when it comes to um, how one should assess therapeutics in a crisis situation, uh, there is no other answer. You have to do this. You know, Tom Chalmers said, randomize the first patient. You have to commit early to evidence generation because if you don't, you just subject many, many more people to potentially deleterious treatments. And all of the things I heard from doctors that, you know, I so many insults, like you're an ivory tower doctor. I was like, well, my, my clinic's in the county. You know, you're this, you're that. You don't know this, you don't know that. Um, those are just... Uh, emotion and they're not the, the answer to the problem. And then some of these other sort of process of science issues, I think those are going to take decades to unpack. And so I look forward to thinking about it more. I'll let you have the last yeah. word. Yeah. All right. I mean, I, I, so a, thank you for all the, the nice things that, that you said that, that makes me feel good. Cause I often don't really have any sense of like, whether I'm even adding any value oh, on, of course you are. on, on yeah. Twitter to be in, to be honest with you, because I feel like sometimes it's just like, it's like a diary. Like I tweet things and then they kind of, you know, disappear. <laughs> Um, but, but I, but I think though, that, um, what crises do and pandemics in particular is they, they, um, dust off, you know, it, you know, it, there could be, there can be fault lines in the ground or cracks in, you know, in, in, um, you know, a, a table and, you know, dust can kind of settle in the cracks and make you think that everything is smoother than it is. Uh -huh. And, um, uh -huh. and crises come and they stress those fault lines. Uh -huh. And yeah. the United States has never been good about the social determinants of no, health. Never. It's, it's, it's riven uh -huh. with inequality. Uh -huh. 
it's 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 riven with um, with with medical and health failures that are a result of the way that we structure our society. And then you see it close up with, um, you know, with the pandemic. And just to take the schools as an example where, you know, reading reports that would say, look, you know, here's a way to bring people back into the schools and it involves testing. And I was like, look, I believe what you say. In fact, I think that, the, you know, I'm per you've persuaded me um, but now, you know, when I turned to my school district, the school district is like, we don't have the funds or the ability to like, we do bake sales so that my kids can play in the band. And we're lucky that they, we have a band, mm -hmm. right? Like, where's the money for the testing going to come from? Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it was like policies that are right and good and that, but are failure to implement. And I think the vaccine is a great example where it's like, the, the wheels of innovation in that space are absolutely phenomenal. Like the, the How ability fast. to amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I did not, my prior was, the, the I didn't, original... I was, I was blown away. I didn't believe they do it before the yep. end of the year. Amazing. No. I, hats off. Oh, but they can't get it in arms. They can't get it in arms. Exactly. And the, exactly. Oh. And so it's like, you know, here's the, on the one hand, we have an amazing, division of labor between people who well uh, with a well-oiled machine of yeah. going from basic science to a product manufactured hundreds of millions of doses yeah. right that will yeah. be manufactured to quality control yes. like amazing standard yes. of quality shipped across the uh, you yes. know the the country and the world but we can't but the on on the other sp parts of society are so um uh, you know, dysfunctional, historically underfunded trouble. public health. Yeah. And you can't get yes, an arm. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't get an arm. And what's going to suffer the last thing, I'll, the, uh, the last point I'll say, the, the thing that's going to suffer are is equity again, yes. yet again, equity. It's yes. going to be like, look, here are the people who are, if we get the vaccine into their arms, we're going to save lives. Right. Um, and then the idea that we can't get, we can't carry that out. And so then people are like, well, let's just give it to anybody. Right. Equity is going to die by the wayside, of not course. because it was a bad idea, not because equity is not important, but because it's not important enough for us to put the money yes. and yeah. the resources and yeah. mobilize people to make it happen. And I think that's a tragedy. I agree with you. And I guess I, I would say that if they had told Pfizer, you only get paid when it goes in the arm. They should have. They, they should have done that. All they need to do is tell Pfizer, Moderna, you get it every dollar you get, every arm you put it in. We're not paying you until then, and they would have made it happen like that. Because as much as uh, uh, they are flawed and and misaligned, and they have so many problems in that system, when you dangle the dollar in the right direction, they know how to jump for it, and um, and they would have they would have crushed it. So that was their mistake. But thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. You've been listening to Season 3 of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.